you know, I think also another area where these categories are so useful is when we are speaking about the law and the spirit. And I'm thinking particularly in Paul's letters, Galatians, for example, but then also in the uh, the letter to the to the Hebrews, of which I'm not saying Paul wrote it, but uh, there are also categories there that are really helpful when we speak about the people, the covenant people under the law, and the covenant people then under the Spirit. If we are trying to, if we're if we're reading those in terms of ordo salutis, you can tie yourself into all sorts of knots. And it's just a helpful uh, tip that if you're new to some of these studies, or if you've, you're old to them and maybe you are tied in knots, <laughs> take a moment, take a few breaths, deep breaths, and start to think of law and spirit for a time. Now, it's not always this way, but think of them as frequently uh, labels for particular redemptive historical epochs, according to Historia Salutis, what God is doing for the people of God, bringing them from immaturity, infancy to uh, immaturity, like childhood, being you know juveniles, then eventually unto their maturity, way that, where they are now of an age to receive their legal inheritance. Paul talks about this frequently, and he is very explicit, I think, in Galatians. So you can think of, uh, you know, Adam and Eve in that that era from Genesis three fifteen up to Moses, the time of the law is kind of a period of infancy, and then when you receive the law, you can largely think of that era under the law as being, you know, kids like middle schoolers, and. As the people of God are middle schoolers, they have what Paul calls a pedagogue or a a tutor who is supposed to watch over them and take them somewhere to prepare them in life so that they would no longer need the tutor, but grow up unto maturity to become adults and then be equipped and capable to receive their inheritance, not squander it and not not become fools or not be ill-prepared to receive the inheritance. Because if you have someone who's not, just think about it, you can't have someone receive all this responsibility and all this potential wealth from, you know, a a well-to-do father and mother. If they're still operating like a nine-year-old, then they will make a shipwreck of these riches and and these responsibilities. They'll die under them. It's also not pleasant to be a nine-year-old or a 13-year-old uh, and have this tutor. <laughs> and sometimes they do things uh, that you don't like that are unpleasant. But it's all ultimately, if they do it well, is meant to move you somewhere into maturity. So when Paul in Galatians and also when the author of Hebrews is speaking, they're, they're frequently talking about the law serving as a guide, as an instructor, Uh, not always a pleasant one, but one that pushes us forward so that when the Holy Spirit is given and when Christ comes, he dies and is raised from the dead, we, you know, in history, the people of God are ready to receive him and then ready to move into a new stage of life, adulthood. That's what the new covenant is. It's mature living. And in the Old Testament, the people were not ready for it, not prepared. Now, I'm not speaking of individuals. Some were prepared more than, you know, sanctified, I'm sure, to to live in New Covenant existence and would have thrived under it. But we're speaking in Historia Salutis categories. The people of God were not yet ready, which is what makes it so much more heinous in Hebrews 6, 10, you know, that whole stretch of where the people of God have been brought in, have received the Spirit. Some have been enlightened. They have partaken of the sacraments. They have come to hear the message of Christ crucified and raised for sinners, but they they got to graduation day and they don't want to move on to adulthood. They want to go back to kindergarten and they want to forsake and trample underfoot if they are to do this and go back to the old covenant forms to go back to the preschool, kindergarten, they're trampling underfoot the blood by which they were sanctified. In effect, it would be as if they are saying, we recognize the Messiah that was given to us in history. We also acknowledge, per se, that, that 
everything leading up to this moment in time has been has, has moved us along to get here. But thanks, but no thanks, God. We don't like the Messiah we got. We want to go back in time to a time of sacrifices in the temple. And maybe the next time around, we'll get a different Messiah that we do like. That's why that is so offensive. Yes. And why sacrifices are an abomination because of their organic unity as a type to point forward to the finished work of Jesus. They're not just saying we prefer sacrifices. In effect, they're saying we don't like the thing that this signifies. Yeah. We want a different one. That's Meaning really, we want a different Christ. Yeah, that's really helpful, Camden, to, to piggyback on it. If you think of that infancy stage, you have the kingdom of God in its heavenly glory, mm. in its upper register glory promised, right? Uh, the land is uniquely, according to Hebrews 11, 10 through 16, is uniquely typical of the heavenly homeland. But when you get to the Mosaic period, moving up to the new covenant under the law, what you get is a kind of intrusion in time mm -hmm. of in, in, in impermanent promises, types, and sacrifices. We might call them impermanent typical forms. The eternal heavenly kingdom is imaged in these forms, a tabernacle, a land, the glory dwelling of God, the, the temple in its more stable form. Yeah. God's glory dwells there atop a mountain. So you get something like a garden mountain dwelling of God. And when Christ comes and you're moving from infancy to those teen years yeah. to adulthood, on the day of Pentecost, to bring it to our Acts 2 point, Christ doesn't ascend into a temple made with hands. He ascends into the heaven temple pitched from the absolute beginning for the glory of God. And the giving of the Spirit, uh, especially in Acts and Hebrews, to use those two, and Galatians, we're born not of the Jerusalem below, but above. Hebrews 12, 22 through 24, we have come to Mount Zion in heaven, the city of God in heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And and so the, the idea of that progressively administered maturity uh, to, to, to say Christ has come, made atonement for sin, ascended into heaven bodily, given the spirit, and is bringing a church to see the glory of his person and work set on display climactically in heaven to say no to that and make that retrograde move to an earlier administration of a gracious uh, revelation from God, but in its earlier seed or bud form, not its right. full blossom form, is there's something so heinous about that, mm -hmm. something so unbelieving about that, something so retrograde about it that the author of Hebrews, like you say, will say there's no longer a sacrifice for sin. If you think that you're going to go back yeah. and get something better, um, you've missed the whole point.